Hi. Hi. Perfect. I had a conversation yesterday with a, a patient about the myth of perfect. Yep. Did you know that there was such a thing as a profession? There are 200 of them in the country. A profession that paints artificial eyes. Wow. And fits the plastic piece that fills in the eye socket. And then they match the color they paint with a single hair sable brush. They paint the colors in the iris to match the other eye. He said, you can't do it from a photograph. The patient has to sit there. You look at that eye and then you paint the other one. Wow. And he's a perfectionist. But he said, I had to eventually stop being a perfectionist because the patient wanted the eye done. So what used to take him four hours now takes him 20 minutes or 30 minutes. Wow. And did you know that a brown eye is 50% purple with streaks of red and little tiny strips of yellow? Wow. And red. Yeah. Purple, we're red. We're like, what, three minutes into this podcast and I'm, I've learned so many things already. <laughs> it's, he's so much fun. He's a friend of George's and the whole philosophical yeah. Harry Van Gelder network yeah. up on Orcas Island and up that way and then down in Ojai. So the conversations, he was my last patient of the day and we should have been done at 3.30 or 4 and I never got out of the clinic before 7 because we'd sit in there and talk and laugh and tell Harry's stories. And he taught me some babies are born without an eye. And so you have this little tiny eye socket and they have to take an impression of the socket. And then as the baby grows, there has to be a filler in there so that the socket will grow with the baby. Like a tissue expander? Yeah, like that. And then it's just, it's been so much fun. I love learning about stuff like that. That was even a thing. And you would never think about that stuff. Yeah. It didn't affect you. And he, he described what we do perfectly. Oh, what was it? He used colorful language to describe it, but it, to modify that language, it's, you fuck around and figure it out. So you, you mess around to be politically and socially acceptable, but then you figure it out. And that's what we do or have done with FSM. Yeah. So he had been in practice for 20 years and his daughter decided to change careers and come and intern with him. He said within six months or a, a year, she was better than he, or as good as he was after 30 years, 40 years of doing it. And I said, yeah, you'd already made all the mistakes. So she started from a different place. Sure. And now she's able to just figure stuff out. That's where we are with FSM. That was the analogy I was getting to what students now as opposed to the poor people that took it between 2000 and 2018 it, the students that are taking it now when I say you can't possibly make a mistake that I haven't already made they're starting from an entirely different place than we started from 20 years ago. We can tell them the things to try and the things to think about, and then they're able to figure it out. For the first time in 18 years, the patient came in with 
a diagnosis of pelvic pain and trigger points. Well, he's the one that had the S2 disc and the pelvic plane and the S2 and 3 nerve irritation that yeah. made the pelvic muscles tight. Three days, I've, this is a fourth or fifth visit. It all started with a penile fracture that wasn't bad enough. Every penis fracture I've ever seen before was really a fracture. There's a straight line. It's clearly fractured. His was more subtle. So the urologist said, nah, you don't have a fracture. But when I finally got his pelvic floor settled down and you ask permission of the patient, tell him to show you where to put your finger. You keep your finger on the outside of the washcloth that's wrapped around his boy parts and touch the place where there's a dent. And he just flinches. And it's, is that the place that hurts? Yeah. Then you go to Dr. Google and you looked up penile fractures and what's, I said, this all started two and a half years ago with a penis fracture. They told me I didn't have one. I said, they're wrong. It's, there's feel this dent. That's not regular. Yeah. And it's the most tender place. Penis fractures bleed and they bleed down the fascial planes into the pelvic floor muscles down into the perineum. They adhere the nerves, right? Because any bleeding creates scar tissue. Right. So you have the disc, you have the nerve to all the pelvic floor muscles. But it all started. So you clean up the stuff that happened afterwards. You start that layer. And then there's this. And he told me about it the first visit. Right. And I believed what this pelvic floor specialist told me. So right. I treated that stuff first. And I, I've only treated three prior to him. They were early and they were real. They were in people that weren't 20. They were in their 40s. And the connective tissue is stiffer as you get older. And mm -hmm. so the fracture, there's a line and it bends and it's poor baby. And I had no idea back then about 124 and 77. So you look at the anatomy. So this is the mess around and figure it out part. You look at the anatomy and I opened up Netter and showed him, this is what we're dealing with. You have connective tissue that's strained, but see all those little blood vessels in there? When those get cracked, they bleed. So the inside has got scar tissue in the capillaries and we have to take out the scar tissue, but then we have to stop the bleeding because when we take out the scar tissue out of those little teeny capillaries, it's going to bleed and scared him to death because the pain went up and I right. said, okay, I can take it down, go. I would never have known to do that. And now on a podcast or in the advanced, I can show a picture of, out of Netter and give somebody an idea about how to think about it. And all this time you're running 40 and 89 nonstop from neck to feet, because this is the most terrifying part of the human body to work on in a male. Yeah, yeah. And 40 and 10 to quiet down the sensitization. Yeah. And then 40 and 396 from the sacrum to the crotch to keep the nerve pain down as you create inflammation by moving it, moving the tissue. Yeah. We treat scarring in the nerve. What, there's one machine just working on inflammation in the nerve. And you treat scarring in the nerve and move it very gently. And it was the most 
excruciating experience yesterday because I did this part at the very end of the session. And whereas he came in calm and confident, he left absolutely terrified because his pain went up. Right. No, so it's going to go back down. So I had another patient, Susan had him just walk around the clinic. Should I have to take this phone call? Just walk backwards down that hall and then walk forwards. And basically by having him walk for almost 30 minutes, it gave his brain something else to think about. And by the time he left, he was calm and confident again. 15 years ago, who would have thought of that? I, hello. What people don't realize is that you and I don't talk before the podcast. And the theme that comes to me is sometimes planned. And sometimes you and I were together in Arizona before I did the podcast. And half an hour before I said to you, excuse me, half an hour before the podcast, I need to be by myself to just hone in on what we're going to do, how we're going to organize it. So I have an alarm that goes off at 2.30 to make sure that wherever I am, I have time to just sit and rewrite the list and make sure that the plan is loosely in place because I know you will derail it, but I just need to have some sort of trajectory to follow. So the word that came to me in my pseudo meditative state today was safety. Oh, yes. And we've talked about being vulnerable as practitioners and when our patients are vulnerable, But where I wanted to like circumvent today is the miracles that I have experienced as a practitioner have all come from the root of the patient feeling safe, safe with their story and safe with the movement. Safe. Safe. So what you were telling me, I was like the story that you were just talking about really circumvented with that. The patient came in with confidence. He felt safe with his story to tell you about something, like you said, completely terrifying. And then you have the confidence and the skill set to unravel it and take him from a place of safety to a vulnerable state. And it's a scary place to have them leave in that state, unless you're confident that it's temporary and you're going to be able to circle the wagons again and bring them back to that pain-free or lowered pain, confident, safe space. And it was about our fifth or sixth sessions. Okay. We're working on pelvic floor patients, whether they're female or male. It's in the sensory and motor cortex. It really is a small part of the sensory and motor cortex. Yeah. But in the limbic system, it's huge. Yeah. Because our sexual function is so linked to emotions and memory. And yeah. the way a patient reacts to any injury or pain in that area will give you an idea about whether or not they were molested or raped. And the it ends up making the central sensitization more of a thing. Mm -hmm. So the safety portion of it is 40 and 89, like literally on one machine. I think the biggest difference in the last five years has been the ability to work with multiple machines. So that when I built this clinic, we had the construction budget and we had the equipment budget And I've got six precision cares and four custom cares and an auto care all in my main treatment room. I haven't worked on anybody in the last month where I used less than five machines. Even if only one machine is running on 40 and 89 the whole time and one is running on 40 and 10. Yeah. So quiet the central sensitization, quiet the spinal cord sensitization. So I worked on a patient with knee pain. You're working that diagram that we have in the core that shows you how the nerves that go into the knee create spinal cord sensitization of pain. Even if I'm working on an arthritic knee, 
I don't need to run 40 and 89 because he's not centrally sensitized. But you, you have to have 40 and 10 quiet the spinal cord sensitization. You have to have that running while you're working on this mildly painful. It's not that the patient feels safe. It's that the nervous system feels safe. Yes. So I had an email. I was after our last podcast or the podcast before we were talking about the emotional protocols and asking like when to use them. And we, both of us kept going back to, is it really anger or did it come from something that you need to run 40 and 89 for first before the emotional component? Like, I, again, I remember being in psychology and talking about that anger wasn't a true emotion. And I'm like, excuse me, it is very true. Like I was so angry driving to class today because someone cut me off and it was like, aha, that came after the fear and terror that you experienced because you almost died and then so you got angry. Fear comes first and then anger. And I know this is your background, so it's clear oh. for you, but for a lot of other practitioners, I think it's important to realize it's not about just throwing nine, the nine seventies at a patient because that all came secondary to the trauma, to the injury, to whatever is going on in their amygdala. It's not about just throwing restored joy at somebody as well, much as we want to. We don't have a way to know about what happened to them when they were five. And so explaining to a patient what their hippocampus knows about what happened when they're five, and they don't know, it's... Yeah subconscious you don't have access to it have a way which is really amazing when you think about it we have a way of quieting the pressure from the without actually talking to the patient about it when we're talking about multiple machines i where i wanted to again have the message to practitioners that are listening who think they can do it all with one machine or a custom care. I don't know anymore that I could treat somebody with one machine because 40, 80 and 89 in the last two months has expedited my results by weeks, if not months, because if you're able to tackle the emotional component of them being terrified, angry, scared, just the stress response of whatever injury or whatever courses of events that led them to your clinic or on your table. And even if you don't even want to think about the mental, emotional, psycho-emotional side of it, it's going to help you get their range of motion smoother faster because anybody that's been in pain and have been restricted they're never going to move freely without compensation and going back to the true way that biomechanical freedom that they need without running 40 and 89 first. You could do all the loading you want, but unless you run 40 and 89 first, it's not going to work or stick. And your whole wipe and load. Yeah. I actually haven't taken your course, which people ought to know, but the whole wipe and load concept is afraid to move it, 40 and 89. And then you tell the cerebellum to forget everything it knows. So you do 40 and 84. Yeah. And then you tell the sensory cortex to forget everything it knows, yeah. or it thought it knew about where you were two hours ago. Yeah. And you do 40 and 92. So you wipe the emotional, physical movement part of it. And then you load it. And you have to fix the periphery. So this patient I treated that had a disc, so he started L5, S1, broad-based disc. So he had S1 and S2 were lit up, were hyperesthetic. He had 30 degrees of trunk flexion. Well, at the end of just treating the disc, he had 45 degree first session. Second session, treat the disc and the nerve, and his range of motion was 
was 75 degree reflection, at which point he just ran into his tummy. We had time and I said, okay, now I'm just showing off. So lay down on your back. And his straight leg stopped at 30 degrees. He said, yeah, I just have tight hamstrings. And I went, I'm not tight hamstrings. I'm just showing off now. Scarring in the nerve. And you hold it and you bend his foot a little bit and you internally and externally rotate a little bit and then it goes to 40. And he went, what? And then it goes to 50. And then you sit there and talk about whatever. And then it goes to 60 and then it goes to 70. And then it stopped at 70. And I went, oh, that's, and he said, yeah, my hamstrings are tight. It's, no, it's not your hamstrings. It's the fat pad around the nerve that's between your butt and your knee. So let's just do sclerosis in the fat pad. And he went, what? So then we did 397 sclerosis in the adipose. And he said, what's sclerosis? And I went, I'm not sure, but sclerosis is what goes away when you run three. He laughed at that. And then his straight leg raise went to about 85. And then I had him lift it actively and it stopped at 30. And I said, yeah, hold that thought did 40 and 89 for about 60 seconds, 40 and 84 for 60 seconds. Then I did 81 and 84. Now lift your leg. And he lifted it to 70 degrees. And he went, what just happened? I just, I'll tell you in a minute. Let's do it to the other leg. <laughs> and it's, it, at that point, it's really fun to just say to a patient that you feel comfortable with, now I'm just showing off. We do it because we can. And this isn't an athlete. He rides bicycles a lot. So we were treating concussion at the same time. Yeah. So I love that. I love <laughs> that you're doing all that. And yes, you haven't taken my course, but you audited my course. So I want to make this clear that the FSM sports course has been audited and blessed by you in its entirety. So yes. I am not some sort of rogue player here that no, no, took it's the like, frequencies and, and ran with it. Yeah, no, we did. I did. I watched it and we talked about it. And the, you blew it up three or four times. And but the, you blew it up started. and showed it. Went, oh yeah, that's right. That needed blowing up. And then you blew it up again. And it's blown up again. And I'm glad I don't have a Kevin that gets mad at me when I rewrite the course because it's just me. Kevin never gets mad at me because I change it every time. He doesn't even roll his eyes anymore. He goes, <laughs> well, of course you did. It's like, it's, right. and it's weird now when it stays the same two courses in a row. Yeah. And that's why the course is getting better. And that's why the practitioners are getting better and better is because you genuinely care about the message that we're putting forth. And it is a completely different message than when I took it, when it was recipe based, formula based, and it almost would get overwhelming. And I think that's why I, in, I've reached out to a lot of practitioners that have been exposed to FSM 10, 15 years ago that you, yeah, you're just like, I'm sorry, but there's, it's just completely different now. And you need to see the way it's being taught because I feel, especially with a certain demographic of physical medicine practitioners, if they followed the script, the one time that it didn't work, it wound up in the closet because they were too busy to try something new, or they were too linear in their thinking to accept their hypothesis was perhaps incorrect. Exactly. Extremity joint. I look now at the standard extremity joint protocols that are in the custom care, and I really have to get them fixed because it's no, just no. It's <laughs> Not that it's no, or it's like wrong or harmful. It's just a bit of a time waster, I find. But as a practitioner, you can still definitely start there. And the software makes it very easy to just click what you is not applicable. And you can build your own program so easily. Remind me to, about insulin and leptin. Okay. 
take the train where it needs to go and then we'll come back to insulin and let them. <clears throat> I want to just keep going on with the safety and the way we're talking to people. We were talking about this a while ago, how you have to be mindful of the words that you use as a practitioner, especially when your patient is on the table, especially when they're prone, you don't want to feed them anything. And I was talking to my girlfriend, who's a psychologist, and she says, you need to talk to your patients like you were talking to your toddler when they drew you something instead of saying, is that a tree? when it was like you or your dog. So I've been really mindful in the past year, especially to ask patients with as many colorful adjectives as they can muster, tell me not just about your pain or tell me about the incident or the trauma, but also I've been trying to ask them more about their future. So instead of saying with athletes, I get it. You're going to want to throw the ball again. You're going to want to shoot the puck. You're going to want to get on the ice, but asking them to tie an emotion into what that future event is going to be has been a bit of a game changer with some of my chronic pain patients. So something like, tell me about what you want to experience when this pain goes down. And I had a patient like, oh what do you mean? What do I want to experience? I'm like, tell me what you want to experience. And I got so choked up because three people in the last two weeks said, I can't wait to just hug my loved ones without feeling pain. And that brought a sense of joy and inspiration and hope to their face that I didn't see. And I said, oh, that's a fantastic goal. Let's work towards that. And, and then as a practitioner, you have to break down what does a hug mean? Well, that means they have to get into extension. They have to get into horizontal abduction and then adduction. You can break down the mechanics. You can have them go through those ranges on the table or sitting up and then show them at the end how they are one step closer to experiencing that joy. Exactly. And their skin, it has to not hurt so with a 40 and 10 with a fibromyalgia patient that's actually the hardest step with a chronic pain patient what what would your life be like if this problem wasn't here and that they have to be able to visualize that but you can't make them visualize it does that make sense totally you, this patient with the pelvic pain has to find something else to do with his life. He has been out of school and not working for two and a half years. Wow. And it's like my goal, for, you're really smart and you are sensitive and intuitive in a way that is unusual for someone your age. My goal for you is to have you go back to school. And he's a Afraid to go back to school because it hurts when he sits but I suspect that he's afraid to get better because he's afraid he's not good enough to go back to school how do we make that leap Louise Hay wrote a book called heal your body back in the 80s I think and I just looked up genital injuries and what her idea is, the affirmation she had and her a little much for some patients, but there it was, was the psycho-spiritual problem that's associated with genital injuries, good enough. And it's, there it is. Now what do I do? So I'll see him back in a month. And this takes it out of the comfort range for a lot of practitioners because I'm a terrible psychologist. You, I'm a physical therapist, occupational therapist, MD, naturopath, acupuncturist, whatever. I'm not a shrink. But understanding that you can use 40 and 89 and 970 and 27 and 23. So fear and over concern, right? And use that 
as you ask the patient that question. So when you're asking them, what is your life gonna be like when this is gone or when it becomes a management problem? So being able to tell him, this isn't going to go away completely. It's a management problem. You can go back to school, you can sit, you can stand, you can walk in the back of the room. You can sit down for 10 minutes. It's gonna be fine. It's a management problem. Right. Oh, okay. So even when you aren't able to get someone 100% better, it's a management problem. You live with it and you do what you can do within the constraints of what it is that you're left with. Right. I don't know. Is that okay with you? You're used to getting people to 100%. I'm used to getting people from yeah and it just goes with the demographics so yeah my pro athletes there is no negotiating we're going back to a hundred percent if not we're going to get you stronger and faster after this injury like there there has to be some measure of hope for excellence and greatness and yeah you have to learn as a practitioner to shift gears i i know with my aging chronic pain patients you're right. It's not going to be a hundred percent. I think that's part of the relationship that you develop with your patients. You have to work together to get some attainable, realistic goals and have some that are maybe a little further out there and have some that are a little bit closer, but have the bulk of it in the middle. That's realistic. And again, it's so important to not want it more than the patient. And that's really hard with chronic pain. I never have to worry about that with athletes so much. What's that? Athletes want it more than you do. Totally. Yesterday. Yeah. And there is a handful that, especially the teenage demographic where I see they don't actually want to get better. And that fear is based maybe from pressure from their parents to continue to play or thinking their only way they're going to get to college is with a sports scholarship, but they actually don't want to play. They're terrified of not the injury, but just failing or not getting the scholarship or not getting drafted into the pros. So there is a lot of fear-based components to even working with athletes. Somehow when you were talking about that, my mind went back to however many weeks ago when you asked me about my favorite frequency and it ends up being 13 and 396. Uh-huh. Yeah. So scarring in the nerve so this patient had a knee replacement and his knee was not quite full range and that limited his straight leg raise. So when I ran 13 and 396, scarring in the nerve, your brain is not going to let you move or use a body part where the nerve is scarred down. Yeah. From either injury, inflammation, surgery, whatever. If it bleeds, if it ever bled, if it ever broke, yep. there's going to be scarring and it will affect this whole spider web of nerves. Yeah. And the cerebellum is connected to the limbic system, is connected to the sensory and motor cortex. And you don't get to move it. It is not negotiable. It doesn't do any good to work on the midbrain right. until you take the scar tissue out of the periphery. So I ran a nerve as I bent his knee. And the look on his face when his knee went to, let's see, 90, 130, like bent completely, he just went. <laughs> how did that okay and then he was able to do a straight leg raise so you have to take care of the peripheral problem yeah the thing that we're able to do if you have multiple machines is take out the central 
sensitization and the spinal sensitization at the same time. And that again goes back to people like, when do you run this? When do you run that? If you have even just two machines, you can run the 4089 on one. Like I always say, I'm always running something in the background. So I always have the custom care running, whether it's 4089, concussion protocol, whatever I need. And then I've got my precision care to, yeah, to think about, to switch gears and go from central to peripheral and be like, okay, I know this needs to happen in the brain, but what's happening in the leg or the wrist or whatever, wherever you're working, but you're right. You could run 4089 all you wanted, but if there is adherence to the nerve, like that's not, your brain is not going to blow through the stop signs and tear or stretch a nerve that's adhered. Like that will okay. never happen. The cerebellum does not notify and it doesn't negotiate. I don't want to scare people to think they have to have five machines to do a decent job. No, you and can do it with one. Most of what you need to do with just a precision care and a custom care if you're a manual therapist. It's when I have to multitask. I have somebody that has had five concussions. His hemoglobin A1C is seven. Oops. And he wakes up in the morning with his blood sugar at 140 or 170. And it's what turns your vagus nerve off at three o'clock in the morning. He said, mm -hmm. okay. I said, yeah, the vagus nerve has as its job to stop your liver from producing glucose. The vagus is turned off by infection, stress, and trauma. So you don't have an infection. You don't have any trauma between the time you go to bed and the time you wake up. So there's some sort of stress that happens in your brain in the middle of the night that turns your vagus nerve off at three o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning. So you wake up with your blood sugar at 170 mm -hmm. fasting. That's the liver and that's the vagus. And knowing that he said how do you know that it's such depth of knowledge it's, no it's all in the vegas webinar i didn't know that before i had to write that webinar so i wrote the net webinar then it all becomes obvious and then once you watch the webinar that all becomes obvious and so be, putting him back together in a week means if I fix his low back and his knee, it doesn't do me any good. If he's a type two diabetic on insulin two months later yeah, and he dies of heart disease because we didn't fix his insulin resist resistance. Mm -hmm. How do you fix insulin resistance? By treating the vagus and by running insulin and leptin while I'm working on his low back and his knee. And the five concussions didn't. Oh, no. And was that the leptin insulin thing that you wanted me to go back to? Because I wrote it down. Yeah, that was it. It was the insulin and leptin. When I looked at the insulin and leptin protocol that's now standard in the custom care mode bank, it includes turning on the vagus is the very last thing you treat insulin resistance. You want to just go through, because we have a lot of lay people that are listening to the podcast. Do you want to just briefly explain what leptin is? Because I think a lot of people have heard of insulin, but not maybe leptin. Yeah. The challenge I have with leptin resistance is I understand it when I'm looking at the protocol and when I'm reading Rob DiMartino's slides on it. Yeah. And you can Google it. Google okay. leptin resistance. But I didn't, I had never heard of it before Rob's lecture. I'll be completely yeah. honest. Okay. And when I read it, it was like, oh my God, why do we not know this? Leptin, I actually can't remember. Leptin is something that's created by adipose tissue and it makes the adipose inflammatory. It contributes to insulin sensitivity and they feed on each other. You actually have to look at the webinar and actually look at the protocol because it has to do with inflammation in the adipose. Okay. And so whereas normally you run inflammation for four minutes in the insulin and leptin protocol, I run inflammation in the adipose for eight minutes. Right. It has to do with stress. So we 
quiet the midbrain, quiet the sympathetics, quiet the adrenals. And it has to do with melatonin. So in the leptin protocol, there's a section on the pineal gland with four or eight minutes to increase secretions in the pineal. So you run it at night. Right. This patient yesterday with this blood sugar issue that's really difficult, it, he bought a magnetic converter yesterday. And then recognizing that the vagus nerve turns off glucose production from the liver. You can have a completely carbohydrate-free diet and have a blood sugar of 180. If you get in pain or under stress, your liver will pour out sugar. It stores it as glycogen. And if you get under stress, your blood sugar will go up because the vagus nerve is turned down by stress or pain. When I was in the ambulance, when they picked me up after I'd had angina for 30 minutes as I was trying to drive home, the T that picked me up out of my car, they put me in the ambulance. He tested my blood sugar. It was 250. Are you a diabetic? No but I've been having angina for the last 40 minutes in my car, right? And I'm fasting, hadn't had anything to eat since lunch, eight o'clock at night. Yeah. And it was just the pain and the stress of the blockage in my heart and that. And my blood sugar was 250. Wow. So I, at that time, that was one of those factoids that sits on the shelf going, I don't understand that. Yeah. And it's now that I know the role of the vagus in suppressing blood sugar from the liver, there's no way to treat type two diabetes without hammering. The quieting the liver is fine, but it's the vagus that controls the liver and glycogen and glucose. Isn't that cool? That's fascinating. I, yes. And once you see it, you can't ever unsee it. That's a great thing. So let's get to some questions before we run out of some time. Cause I think there's some good ones here. Is it time? Oh my gosh. Okay. I know. Did we have questions. So let's go to Summer's question first. Thoughts on a trapped pudental nerve. 71 year old man is in so much pain. Someone did some deep work on his sacral plexus that triggered it. However, he had an inguinal hernia six years ago with mesh that may be underlying issue. Numb on the left cheek, left testicle and half of his penis. He is in major pain. <laughs> okay you understand summer that this is a straight up guess okay but numb means the nerve is not working mm -hmm. deep work on the sacral plexus if you think about where the sacral plexus is i don't even know how anybody could work on it because it's inside on the anterior surface of the sacrum. If it's numb, okay, a hernia and the mesh is very superficial. It could affect a cutaneous nerve and create pain that's local in the abdomen as an allergic reaction. When you work on a hernia, you don't even go into the peritoneum, it's all superficial. You can put the mesh and the hernia in the superficial part, but you have to look at the timing. When did the major pain start? Did it start after the deep work on the sacral plexus? If his cheek and his penis and his testicle are numb, somebody tore the sensory nerve that goes to that. So you can try going from his sacrum. So put a cell under his sacrum, and then you put a off from his pubic bone down across his penis, around the testicles, down to the ischial tuberosities, because the pudendal nerve 
comes out just at the initial two velocities. Try 40 and 396, quiet the nerve. That's not going to work, but you should start there. Trauma to the nerve, that's also not going to work, but you should start there. Then increase secretions in the nerve and see if that reduces the pain. That will tell you if the nerve is intact. Does that make sense? If Me. the nerve is intact yep. and you increase the secretions of the nerve, the numbness should start to improve. Running a pinwheel over someone's penis or testicles is never what you want to do first. So you have them raise their leg and you run the pinwheel over the bottom of their butt cheek. And if 81 and 396 doesn't reduce the pain, then you have to consider the possibility that the nerve is torn, that somebody did deep work aggressive enough that they actually tore the sensory nerve to that, to those parts. It's S2 and S3. Try 40 and 89. And that is basically phantom limb pain in his penis, his testicle, and his butt cheek. It's S2 and S3 is what you're looking at. You can find them in Netter. And if it's phantom limb pain, it goes away in what, Kim, 20 minutes? Yeah. Roughly. Roughly. If 40 and 89 takes the pain away, then the nerve is torn. And then what I would say, you don't have to do anything, but what I would say is now we have to see if this is going to last. I want to see you back in two days. If it comes back, it's not going to be worse, but you're going to mind it more and it's going to scare you. If it worked this time, it will always work. And this may involve you having to, or being able to treat yourself at home with a home you don't want to come see me every two or three days right each time you treat it it might last longer so that's the progression is the nerve intact can you repair the nerve so it works properly if you can't with 81 and 396 then it's torn and then it's phantom limb pain in his penis testicle and butt cheek okay and she okay. added at the bottom, it was a shiatsu therapist put his elbow on a sacrum because the patient had glute tightness. So that was good. Okay. Derek asked. Hi, Derek. Hi, Derek. To get the quote, I don't want to get better client. And he's asking for 40, 89, 84, 92, or 970 slash fear while asking the patient, what would it be like if you were better? Yeah, I'd go with that. That's a good plan. You understand the problem. Yeah. And then Dana has a comment. Is there a place for us patients to report anecdotal instances where say I had a consistent 140 plus morning fasting glucose reading that went down by running concussion in Vegas? Ooh. I'll ask Kevin. We just had a meeting with our web designers, the new FSM website, they've been working on it for a year and we're hoping it'll be done by February so I can announce it and we can launch it, but there's no guarantees. That would be cool. And I'm not sure. Can we do that? Where they can just submit what? I don't understand. Anecdotal reports. So the patient treats themselves for insulin and leptin resistance or concussion in Vegas and their fasting glucose went down. So if we open it up like that, the challenge is that we also get all sorts of I random. You, yeah, I think you would just have to have somebody approve it before it got posted to make sure that it and was. The other thing that I would do is tell your practitioner and have your practitioner collect the data and present it as a case report or write it up. So I'm um, I hate to be a broken record that we have to get this stuff published, yeah. even as a single case report. So you have consistent blood sugar readings and you report those, and then you start X treatment with frequency specific microcurrent. And then 
the blood sugar readings went to this and we were also doing these supplements or that. And then that's data and that's a case report and that's publishable. And I swear to God, I will pay you $2,000 for publishing it. One of our practitioners in Kuwait is a dentist and she is going to get a wire transfer for $2,000 because she published in a peer-reviewed journal case report on post-herpetic neuralgia. And as a dentist, it must have been in a facial nerve. And wire transfer is coming. And Terry Turner is presenting a collected case report on Ehlers-Danlos at the symposium, I think she should. And she's going to publish that. She said that. And I said, as soon as you have a reprint, there is a check for $2,000 that will be presented next year. I love giving away money for published papers. It's my yeah. favorite thing next to fixing patients. Uh -oh. Awesome. And then Leif said, maybe the same approach as a Facebook forum. Maybe because we moderate or mediate or monitor that a little bit, right? It might, it would, it might go on Facebook, but as a different page. Yeah. Because the case reports have to go through the practitioners that the challenge is practitioners, if you're like me, you start at nine or 10 o'clock in the morning and you finish at six or seven, you go home, you have dinner, life happens. And then it's Saturday and sitting down to write up a case report is not something you want to do. No. So the practitioners are wonderful, but also a black hole. It's so I don't know how it, I'm resorting to bribery. I, it's like, there's a carrot. I have no sticks, just carrots. <sighs> needs to be chocolate maybe that could be better oh yeah and i just bought five packages of dark chocolate with almonds mm -hmm. out almonds to put in big bowls at the advanced we have 130 already signed up 130 for the advanced 100 for the symposium and usually what happens is people come to the advanced and they can't stand it so they end up staying for the symposium so we'll yes. get close to 130 the ballroom, I don't want to put more than 150 or 60. We're close and we're six weeks away. Speaking of, I had two cancellations for the sports course. So there are two spots open and I am not on social media right now to promote it. So I will let two people in. There's my clock that's saying that it's four o'clock. I do have a quote to share. So it says, when we feel safe enough to expose our shadows, that's when we become free. There is so much background to that. So I know. The concept of your shadow self is Jungian. And the lady that, that wrote the book on death and dying and making friends with and not being afraid of Alf. Oh, hi, Alf. How are you? And not being afraid of your shadow self. So the parts of me that I don't care to reveal, the parts of me that I don't like, when you accept those parts, they lose power. And it's, it goes along with emotions buried alive. Kubler-Ross. God, I love it when you're here, Leaf. Thank you. Yes, Kubler-Ross. There you go. Dana said that everybody. Thank you. Yes. When you make friends with your shadow self, it's like making friends with the emotions and the insecurities that you buried. Right. Once you admit, and this was something that Kubler-Ross said in a lecture I went to in the 1970s, in San Diego, once you admit that there is a part of you that could be Hitler, that could have done those angry, evil things, those thoughts that come through your head when that guy cuts you off on the freeway, or when you see a group of people that we can think of right now that you really can't stand their behavior or their politics or their 
ways of thinking. Once you accept the fact that could be them if you let yourself, that there's a part of you that is like them, then you can integrate all the parts of yourself and accept them and understand that you choose not to be like them. I could, there's a part of me and I accept that part, but I choose love. I choose compassion. I choose integrity. I choose competence. I choose relationship. And once you choose that, and you are that, it's hard to explain until maybe you're 60 something and you actually can manage to do it. And Dana said, I thought it impossible that my pinky finger could ever be a Hitler until I was in a car accident and in chronic pain. It's true. Just love you. I love you. I love this. I love everybody. I just love, love. I'm choosing love all the time. I choose love. This is cool. All right. We will see you next week. We will. I can hardly wait. Six more sleeps. Six more sleeps. (laughs) Bye, everybody. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.